Welcome back. We've made it to the end of the course. The only thing left is the final exam. And we've got uh, questions from learning module 10 on attention, learning module 11 on a language, and learning module 12 on judgment and decision making. I also assigned a final reading, and it's this paper right here. You can download it off of Blackboard. This one was written in 1985 by Pierre Perrochet, and it's called A Pitfall for the Expectancy Theory of Human Eyelid Conditioning. It's not super long, as you can see. Uh, there it is, a couple, five pages. And I like this paper a lot. It's a fantastic experiment, really interesting pattern of data. And it ties together some themes we've been talking about across the course. If you zoom into the beginning of this paper, you can see some terms that should be familiar to you from our earlier discussions of associative learning and Pavlovian conditioning. So we have the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. And this paper is actually looking at human Pavlovian conditioning. And what we discussed in previous lectures was mostly to do with animals learning that uh, stimulus could predict a, um, some kind of outcome and that they might learn uh, to make a particular kind of response whenever uh, an associated stimulus occurs. So this paper looks at something called human eyelid conditioning. And in a human eyelid conditioning experiment, um, some kind of stimulus like a tone, like a beep, would be presented. And at the same time, or following the tone, a little puff of air would be blown onto your eye. And it's not a lot of air, but it's just enough to make someone blink. And so uh, if you do this a lot of times, hear a tone, get a puff of air on your eye, you hear the tone and you blink, hear the tone and you blink, and I keep doing that, you start to learn uh, an, an association between this sound and getting that puff of air. What you can do is then present the sound and no air puff and see if people blink. And before this paper was written, we know uh, that something like that occurs, that people will blink when they hear the tone, and it's as if they've learned an association that when they hear the tone, they're conditioned themselves to blink uh, because they're essentially preparing for the air puff that they've learned will usually happen every time they hear the tone. So next, um, I want to talk about a distinction we've made throughout this entire course. One distinction is the distinction between controlled and strategic processes and uncontrolled or automatic or habitual processes. So if we know that we can show human eyelid conditioning, uh, what kind of learning is taking place? That's a debate that was going on in 1985. One question uh, or one possibility is that people learn the associations between a tone and an, an air puff in a different way than other animals. For example, if you're sitting in this experiment and you, every time you heard the tone, you got the air puff, you'd realize the association, you would know what it is, and you could prepare, you could decide to blink your eyes every time you heard the tone. It could be up to you. Um, you could also decide maybe not to do that if you wanted to. Another possibility is the learning that occurs, uh, linking the tone to the eye blink response, could be kind of an automatic form of learning. Maybe it's more like the kind of learning that other animals demonstrate. So potentially, when you hear the tone, if you've learned an association with the eye blinking response, you might just blink your eye kind of out of habit. And um, this you might not even realize you're doing it. It could be kind of an automatic thing. So this paper creates an experiment to address these two basic ideas. Here we are on page two. We're looking at a graph that shows some of the predictions for this experiment. Let's take a look first at the strength theory predictions. Now, what we're looking at is um, a graph with probability of CRs 
on the y-axis. That's the probability of a conditioned response. And in a human eyelid conditioning experiment, that would be the probability that you blink because blinking is the conditioned response to hearing that tone and getting that puff of air. Okay, so let's look at the bottom here. What we're looking at is 4, 3, 2, 1, and 1, 2, 3, 4. 4, 3, 2, 1, successive non-reinforcements, and 1, 2, 3, 4, successive reinforcements. What does this refer to? Well, one of the very interesting manipulations in the experiment we're gonna read about has to do with uh, whether or not the tone is followed by an air puff. So the way the author set up this experiment was that it would be 50% uh, like a coin, basically. So you're sitting there, every time you hear a tone, half the time you get the air puff, that's called a reinforcement, and half of the time you don't get the air puff, and that's called a non-reinforcement. Now, because it's like a coin, certain kinds of runs can happen. You could get a tone and an air puff, and a tone and an air puff, and a tone and an air puff. That would be three successive reinforcements. You could then get a tone and no air puff, and a tone and no air puff. And that would be two successive non-reinforcements. And you could get randomly a, a string of reinforcements or a string of non-reinforcements. So what we're seeing in this graph, according to strength theory, this is the idea that every time the tone and the air puff get paired together, you strengthen automatically the association between the tone and the conditioned response of blinking. So the more you get tone, air puff, tone, air puff, tone, air puff, that's the more it is successively reinforced. What we see in the graph here, the prediction is the stronger the um, association between the tone and the conditional response should grow. And according to this idea, that means you should make more and more conditioned responses after having more successive reinforcements. To make it really simple, the more the tone and the air puff are paired together in a row, the stronger the association becomes and the more likely you're make, you are to make a conditioned response. The more the tone is not followed by the air puff in a row, you know, you start losing that association. So the probability of making the conditional response goes down. All right, I think we've covered strength theory predictions well enough here. Let's move on to expectancy theory. So expectancy theory has more to do with judgment and decision-making biases, which was the theme of the very last learning module. And if we take a look right above this graph, we see something here called the gambler's fallacy phenomenon. If you've ever heard of that before, you might be able to guess what the predictions from expectancy theory are. So the gambler's fallacy is basically to expect that long strings of successes or long strings of failures in a chance situation um, should uh, correct themselves. So if you're flipping a coin and you got, and, you, and it's a truly random coin and you got heads and you got heads again and another heads and four heads and five heads. What, what the gambler's fallacy is, is this feeling that people get that that's way too many heads in a row. I, if you're to ask me what's going to happen next time, it's going to be tails. It's got to flip back because this is random. You can't have five heads in a row. It's got to flip back. Similarly, if you got like a lot of tails in a row, you would start, you would start to think that the next time has a increased likelihood of flipping to the heads side. Now in a random situation, what happened last time you flipped the coin doesn't predict anything about what will happen next time. 
So it's a fallacy to think that if you have a long string of one um, outcome, it will increase the probability of flipping to the next one on the next trial. Now, the coin flip situation is embedded into this experiment a little bit. On every trial, the tone 50% of the time is followed by the air puff, and 50% of the time it isn't. And if people are um, showing conditional responses because of their own expectations, we can derive a prediction for the probability of making a conditional response based on those expectations. So here's our, the, 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 here are the expectancy theory predictions. And in th the way they go is basically the opposite of strength theory. So let's work this out. And we can talk about successive, uh, how about successive non-reinforcements first? You know, you're sitting in the experiment and you realize that you hear the tone, sometimes it's gonna cause this puff of air, make your eye eyeballs blink. And actually, we'll learn in a moment, how about right now, let's scroll down. The instructions given to participants included the information that tones were randomly followed by an air puff on 50% of the trials. Okay, so people knew it was gonna be like a coin. Now let's consider what might happen to your expectation about the air puff if you get um, non-reinforcements in a row. So let's go way out here. You just got a tone and no air puff. You just got a tone and, an, and no air puff. And another tone and no air puff. The idea is that because of the gambler's fallacy, you're going to start increasing your expectation that the air puff will actually happen. So if it doesn't happen four times in a row, you're gonna have a very strong expectation that it will happen. So you'd be really prepared for the air puff and it'll show maybe um, a conditioned response even if the air puff isn't presented because of your strong expectation. If we go on the other side, think about what happens when you get the tone and the air puff, that's a, that's a reinforcement trial. And if that happens a whole bunch of times in a row, you might be sitting there going, well, it's happened four times in a row. It's probably not going to happen next time. In which case, when you get the tone, you, because you expect the air puff to be less likely, you might have a reduced probability of a conditioned response. So as we can see, it's possible that an automatic process is causing a strengthened association between the tone and the conditioned response. And if that's what's happening in this experiment, conditioned responses should show, um, should get more probable as the number of successive reinforcements increase. It's also possible that people uh, are learning the, the way they're learning this information is different. It's not involving an automatic process of associative learning. It could be driven by um, their controlled or strategic decision-making processes. And that could even be influenced by biased expectations. So if people are sitting there and they're thinking about what they expect will happen on the next trial, and what they expect will happen is going to change whether they blink their eyes. Uh, we see this opposite pattern of predictions. So let's check out the experiment. There was uh, 16 people in the experiment. The condition stimulus was a seven dec 70 decibel one second tone of 1000 hertz. So that's the thing you would hear on each trial. The unconditioned stimulus was a puff of nitrogen of 2 PSI for a duration of 50 milliseconds, and it was delivered to the left cornea through a one millimeter tube. So you're sitting in, in a chair and you've got this like tube that can blow air on your eyeball. Yeah. Here's the instructions. Participants were escorted into a sound attenuated, dimly lit room 
separate from the apparatus room. They were seating in a chair facing the screen. They were told that tones were randomly followed by an air puff on 50% of the trials. The other thing that people were instructed to do in this experiment, so they're basically just sitting there and they hear a tone and sometimes it, the air blows on their eyeball and the researchers are measure, uh, measuring whether they blink or not every time. But they're also uh, give participants the task to rate their expectancy for the air puff occurrence. So in every trial, you get the tone, the air puff goes off or not, and then you get a little question. Hey, do you think on the next trial, the air puff is going to happen after you hear the tone? You got two buttons. You can say, yep, I think it's going to happen or another button. Nope, I don't think it's going to happen. So we're able to measure both the condition response of eye blinking and also whether people expect the air puff to happen or not. So let's check out the results for the first experiment. Here are the results for the uh, percent conditional responses as a function of the successive number of non-reinforcements or reinforcements. We're just going to look at this data right here for experiment one. And this is very clearly in line with one of the predictions up here. Which one is it? For my money, it's the strength theory, very clearly. And in the actual data, people's conditional responses of eye blinking went up and up and up as the number of reinforced trials or runs increased from one, two, three, and four. In other words, if you got the tone in the air puff four times in a row, you showed the most conditional responses. That's when the association was strongest. If you got four trials in a row where it was not reinforced, you got a tone and no air puff and a tone and no air puff four times in a row, your conditional response, you, you didn't blink your eye as much uh, when you heard the tone. So this is some compelling evidence that the learning driving the conditional response could have an automatic basis. Let's take a look at the other dependent variable. It's over here. This was the expectancy rating. So remember after every trial, participants got to say whether they expect the air puff to occur after they hear the tone. Now, um, what does this data look like? If we go back to the predictions here, it sure looks a lot like the expectancy theory predictions. Let's jump back to the data, talk about it just a little bit longer. So what we're seeing here is that as you get the tone and the air puff over and over and over again, so you either get it once and then it switches or two in a row or three in a row or four in a row, the more you get the tone and the air puff in a row, the, the lower your expectancy rating. So if you're getting it in a row a lot, you start expecting that the air puff won't follow the tone because you think it's random. People are saying, I'm expecting it not to happen. Meanwhile, their conditioned eye blink is actually happening more and more, even though they're expecting less and less and less. Similarly, if the sequence of trials uh, has a, a run of non-reinforcements, the longer the run, the more people start saying that they expect the tone to be followed by the air puff. So if you got tone, no air puff a whole bunch of times in a row, people start saying, well, I think it's going to happen next time. So they're really prepared in terms of uh, their uh, judgments and decision-making that they're making for themselves. However, even people, however, even though people are saying that they expect that, a tone to be followed by an air puff. They don't show very many conditioned responses, even though they're ready to do it. All right, that's our 
overview of this paper. That should uh, give you enough context, I think, to read the paper and also to answer the, the questions that will be on the final exam, seven of which are on that final exam review sheet that I just sent out. All right, the last thing here, this new paper that I'm showing, it's not an assignment, but if you thought this was interesting, I encourage you to go and read the 2015 paper by the same author. It's called Dissociating Conscious Expectancies from Automatic Link Formation in Associative Learning, a review of the so-called Perrochet effect. And this is several, I think, 30 years later uh, from when he did the first experiment that we talked about. And so a bunch of things have happened since then, and you could catch yourself up on that debate by reading this paper. All right, that's it. Good luck on the final exam and have a great summer. It's been really enjoyable being your instructor for this course. And uh, I think that's it for now. So, see you next time.